Just a call to order the November 17th, 2021 mid-month meeting of the Ducktown Council. And at this time, we'll go to item number one, presentation discussion of traffic study by Andrew Tapp and Crystal Witt with VHB. I'll start by turning this over to uh, Director of Community Development, Joe Hurd. Joe? Right, well, thank you, Mayor Kingston. Thank you, members of council here today. Um, as you may be aware, I'll try to make this brief in the introduction. We'll have plenty of other discussion going on during the course of the afternoon. Um, but you'll recall um, just you know, a few months ago, we began to get some, some emails and comments from members of the public regarding concerns about traffic in duck, looking at weight, you know, what, what were the causes, what you know, different people were throwing out, different their perceptions of what was going on. And the, the council opted at one of your meetings to request staff to, to facilitate a traffic study where we can really get a better handle. So we're able to answer some of those questions that were being presented to you and to us as a staff, um, but also um, an opportunity to, to take a look at if, you know, we have some, some experts and, um, you know, hoping to pick their brains a little bit on some ideas that we could consider if, if there are things out there where we could, at least in some moderate way, help the situation. So um, I'll, I'll be real honest with you. I, was, I felt very blessed that BHB, um, who's worked with us for, you know, on so many projects over the years, was able to not only say yes, but say yes and jump right on. I mean, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciated that and their ability to get on and get some of that initial data collection done while we still, it was the tail end of our, our high season. Um, so it's been a, a couple of months. So they've been putting together some, uh, you know, supplementing that with other data, preparing the reports that you're going to hear today. Um, but again, I think we we did a better job than I even hoped in capturing some of that data at the end of the high season, not waiting until it tailed off a little bit. So hopefully that helped give them some insights they may not otherwise have had. And um, yeah, their ability to do that really helped this project, and I think really strengthens the the recommendations, the findings that they've made in the study. So, um, all that being said, um, what we have for you today are, are two separate presentations. So, the first of which, um, Andrew Top with VHB, um, and Chris DeWitt was also involved. Um, at least peripherally, and you know, in helping move this study forward, um, we'll be presenting the traffic study. So this is going to be—he's going to have a lot of facts and figures, telling you about what's going on in Duck, um, as well as some some thoughts and recommendations at the end. And then the second presentation we have is a little bit more specific. Um, we have Lauren Blackburn. Um, who is now also employed by VHB at one time. She was the head of the state's pedestrian and bicycle program. Um, someone who, there's at least a few of you who may have interacted with her previously in that role. Um, but she is there as well as Brian Mayhew, who is has that same role now with NCDOT. So the, the second study was sort of a, hand in hand with some VHB, some NCDOT involvement in that. And they have focused specifically on the pedestrian crosswalks and their, their impacts. They, they have a more detailed breakdown of what's happening at those. And again, also some recommendations. So that's what you're gonna hear today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Andrew, who's with us. The second presentation will be all virtual just because of scheduling and things like that. They weren't able to come in person, but the, the pedestrian crosswalk one will be virtual. So Andrew, thank you for coming today and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Joe, and appreciate the uh, opportunity to, to speak to you guys. And um, uh, I think we came, I came here originally when we were setting up equipment and meeting with volunteers and we had some help from the, uh, the staff has been incredibly helpful to assist with the data collection. And what we'll do is set up cameras, set up tubes, things like that. But when you have some 
uh, local volunteers that can really observe operations. It really made made uh, our understanding of the operational issues a lot clearer here. So um, definitely wanted to thank you for, for being here. And let me just, uh, here it is. Okay. And um, a lot of what our, uh, in early discussions, we were at the, uh, as Joe mentioned, we were at the very tail end of the high season. I think we had about a week and a half, two weeks before um, that, that Labor Day weekend and things really start to taper down a bit. So um, our, our urgency was to go ahead and get the data collected while we were in that high season. And then at that point, that gives us some time to really digest the information. We can do some more detailed uh, you know, traffic studies, other things, but let's just let's just go ahead and, and get the information, and that's useful to really first, uh, you know, understand what the problem is, understand what the causes of the congestion are, and then at that once you kind of know the know the know the issue, know the problem, then you can think of ways to to potentially address that issue. So a lot of what we did was really collect this data, and that's. That's the bulk of the presentation is sharing what we found, what, what the volumes are. And, and I, I've been, uh, I'm a traffic engineer with BHP and I've been doing work, traffic work and for about 20 years in the state. And we're accustomed to looking at uh, 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 you know, turning movement counts, how many lefts, rights, throughs, opposing directions. And that, those pieces of information are what we use to decide, okay, do we need a turn lane? Do we need a signal? Does it meet the threshold for a warrant for those types of improvements or signalization? So I'll roll through them pretty quickly and I'm used to seeing these numbers. Um, so I'll, I'll probably go through, but if y'all have any questions, certainly I could certainly slow down. And as you can see on this, this list, there were really four elements of the data collection. One was a, a, a pneumatic tube that collects a continuous seven day, 24 hours a day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, tire hits going over it. So purely vehicular counts, doesn't tell us pedestrian or bikes, but but uh, vehicle counts, so total ins and outs by direction. And then uh, we set up cameras at 12 intersections and we partnered with staff to identify what might be our areas or intersections of interest. And they all included, um, uh, you know, at prominent intersections in, in the village area, some intersections to the south, some to the north, as far north as Sanderling. And, um, and then the, what the camera counts will do will pick up um, the, the vehicular turning movements, the bicycle <laughs> activity, and the pedestrian activity. And within that spring of 12 cameras, we set up five of them to do a, a Wi-Fi checkpoint where if a vehicle will go past one, it'll detect that Wi-Fi code from a cell phone or some kind of device. And then the next intersection up that has that activated will hit when the travel time is. So it gives us a little bit of a different information. It gives you a travel time between data points. And it's just a sample. It's not 100%. It's more like you know 15 or 20, but still gives you a kind of sense of what the rolling travel times might be through the, through the town um, during the or collection period. And then the fourth one I touched on earlier was just having some a, a sample of, of uh, manual observations from volunteer, community volunteers, uh, making note of what the causes of the cues were each time vehicle stopped, you know, make a note of how long that queue was, what was the cause of that queue. And we had kind of a, a, a sheet that we filled out and gave some instructions and, and I'll report that information as I go as well. So uh, these are the four locations. So Seahawk, Marlin, Sandy Ridge, and Oyster Catcher, maybe easier to see here. Uh, with the north uh, being to your to your left on the screen, uh, kind of you know in, in the village, a little bit south of the village, uh, to to the north of the village, and then picturing the capturing kind of the entering into town towards the southern end as well as the, the northern end. And what we found is the the Saturday, as you would have imagined, was the high volume day. Um, highest uh, quite, by quite a bit with, with Sunday following that. And then Friday, Thursday, Wednesday, kind of moving downward tended to be your, your peak weekday. You can actually see it a little bit better here. So um, each of the color bands on this figure uh, represent uh, each of the four locations, the blue, the orange, and so on. 
and then you'll see uh, a Wednesday, Thursday, uh, Friday, 27th, 28th, all the way through to the following Wednesday. So these are the two counts, uh, total volumes um, uh, over the course of that eight day period where the tubes were installed um, on, the, on, the, uh, on NC-12. And over to the left is your uh, daily volume. And that's a, a total in both directions. So the highest blue line that you see there got to be about uh, 20,000 cars a day on that peak day that we, we collected. And you know, one thing to point out, and uh, the next line down is 15,000. Um, 15, you see some lines, um, particularly on Saturday, all four lines, all four locations were above that 15,000 threshold. And that's sort of a round number that we, um, in the traffic engineer, engineering uh, uh, world, think of as sort of a, 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 a two-lane road that's fairly low speed, that has a lot of driveways and activities. 15,000 you know, cars a day is pretty close to that, that capacity. Uh, within Duck, there's not a lot of heavy cross-street volume, side streets where you have to have a a signal to stop the main line. So you can maybe get a little bit more than that, but just as a round number, um, you'll see that the, the, the current volume that we captured at the tail end of, of our peak season uh, was bumping up against the capacity. And that's important in that when you're, you know, at 16,000, 17,000, 18,000, really all it takes is just a little bit of a hesitation, <laughs> uh, some additional yielding, a, a, a truck that might park or, or maybe over turning left. And then you, you start to see some pretty quick spillbacks as, as you guys are familiar with in this area. And then we, we also have sort of by, by, you know, by direction, I'm just sort of toggling between Northbound and Southbound here, but generally the trend is similar that the total volume in the, in the Northbound and Southbound direction tends to be fairly equivalent over the course of the day. Now you might have more of a, inbound in the morning or outbound in the PM, the peaks, but the course of the day, it's usually pretty even. And, and, and what these lines will show is this is a, a 24 hour period. So to the left is midnight uh, and then during the day, sort of the middle of the graph, you'll see at, at 10 o'clock, the noon, 14, you know, two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, and you see sort of two dips uh, at each, you know, and those are pretty close to your morning and afternoon peak where you may have a, a speed drop during that time. So this is uh, south of, of Seahawk Drive and the uh, darker, uh, darker lines include the drop. And uh, if you look, just look at the northbound direction, you, you see more of a, 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 a you know, a drop, um, you know, around the five o'clock hour. Southbound direction, more of a, you see the one drop uh, at nine o'clock. But for the most part, the, the lines are pretty close to a, a 35 mile per hour. They're high in the, in the very late evening hours. You see those ones jump above the 35 miles an hour. So that's above, you know, the posted speed limit. But for the most part, at this particular spot, um, and we tried to locate the tubes, not at a crosswalk, not at an intersection. It really gives us our best shot where we think the speeds could be, could be higher. So this is probably on the high end of how <laughs> speeds could go. Uh, you may, they might've passed by these set of tubes at 35 miles an hour, hit that first intersection. There might've been a turning vehicle or a crosswalk and they might have to wait just past that. But, for this one snapshot, uh, the, the prevailing speed at this moment over the course of the week generally ranged from you know, 30, 30 to 35 miles an hour. Okay, and then just jumping into north, north of Marlin Drive, and this is getting kind of close into the, to the village area. Um, we, we located it in a, in a place where we tried to avoid uh, major crosswalks and driveways, but they're kind of continuous through here. And actually I have a picture of this installation. You, you may notice the, the line dropping off on the side. And that was one towards the very tail end of our cow that the tubes actually came loose. Um, 
And you can see it really just dropped on the on the end of the Wednesday. And I'm actually here, here they are right there. So you see how they're nice and tight uh, at the far end of the road uh, at a 24 inch spacing that we want, and then they got loose by the end. So this is how we found it at the end of the following week. But that'll explain in the um, when we're looking at the, the southbound direction towards us and northbound would be away from us from this where the picture perspective is. So um, the count still stayed pretty good on the uh, on the northbound direction, but but it, towards the tail end of the week, uh, you see the brown line at the bottom. It, it was not um, measured properly. But what this graph will show you, these two graphs show you, is that there's a lot more in town variation in speeds. They're not consistent. They're not around the speed limit um, for the for the most part. Um, you know, at the 25 mile per hour zone, but uh, a good good bit of the, the traffic during the day is down to you know, 25 below 25. So, so, so they certainly slow down through here. Um, and uh, you know, Monday had a fairly low speed. Saturday has some of the lowest speed as well. And that's of course largely due to that volume increase. Um, vehicles will slow down quite a bit as, as the traffic volume increases. So this is uh, north of, of Sandy Ridge Road, and the yellow is the Saturday. You, you definitely see the, the drop in that direction. And that's going into town from the north. Uh, northbound heading out of town was pretty consistent. It's pretty free flowing up there. You, you get in, you're kind of leaving town, the speed sort of increased through there. Um, and it was, we found that you know, speeds were pretty consistent throughout the week uh, around the speed limit of 35. But again, looking just in the southbound direction, that yellow line Saturday, uh, there was definitely a drop for not even just a short period, but really for multiple hours, it was slow going into town. And that might indicate a, just a lot more congestion, a lot more activity. There's some, maybe some crossing activity that creates a bit of a, a downstream uh, effect to the, at this location. Uh, and then north, north of uh, Oyster Catcher Lane, um, further, you know, that's well, well north of, of the village now. Was uh, you see a bit of a dip on Saturday as well. So uh, with that, so those were giving us sort of a snapshot of what the speeds could be, just really right at our data collection point. This is the um, using the cameras, using the Wi-Fi to provide more of a of a, of a, of a travel time. Um, and Tuckahoe, Aqua, Crook, uh, Wigan Drive, and Sanderland were, were the intersections where we had that setting uh, turned on. Kind of a snapshot of how those are spread. Tuckahoe in the south end, all the way up. And this is uh, a table that that. So towards the, uh, you see average northbound travel time in minutes uh, and then southbound travel time. Um, and then you have a, it in miles per hour, as well as a 85th percentile, which is kind of a high end speed. That's a, a number that traffic engineers tend to use to, um, that, that is helpful with setting speed limits and so forth. And I'll point out from Tuckahoe to Sandrine, which is the full, basically the full drive through town on the Wednesday that we collected, uh, northbound, the average uh, mile per hour um, was, about, was about 30, uh, and then southbound was, it was slightly less than 30 miles an hour. And that uh, on Saturday, the 30 dropped to uh, about 28, and then the southbound dropped to 25. So on average, you, you saw the 35 miles an hour on the outskirts, but you factor in the, the hesitation to slow down. Still, the average speed was about 25. Now, on Saturday, uh, and those are the last two columns to the right, a couple numbers down, the, north, the average northbound speed was uh, about 21 miles an hour. Southbound was about 18 now. 
and then when you um, uh, and then you, you 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 take it, or I'm sorry, the um, the last two columns are, are really just in through the village area. So it's just let me just uh, double check that. So between number two and number three, just opposite the Cook Drive. So that's a distance of about 0.7, so less than a mile. Your average speed through that stretch was um, 20 miles an hour, 17, and then on Saturday, about from 21 to 16. So you may end up with an average speed of about, of about 25 at one spot here or there, but when you take into account the average speed through that whole stretch, it's, it's 16 miles an hour. Uh, on, on that Saturday that we collected. And we, we did not um, see in the data a major, and you guys have, you probably all think of times where there really has been a complete gridlock where no cars are, you know, there's something happened to the road, there was an accident and, and it really, was, this was, we felt like was probably just regular, typical Saturday activity. You know, there might've been some, some truck activity, some other things that would be pretty pretty common. But again, uh, average travel time below hits about uh, 16 miles an hour. And what these charts will show, just to, just to explain is that as the color kind of orangish line represents um, each individual trip of a certain time period. So where you see the, a lot of uh, uh, lines where there's bit of a, a curve there, 10, 10 to 11 minutes tends to be a common uh, trip time. So you would see the bulk of the trips tend to be in that 10 to 11 minute, looking at the southbound uh, in similar uh, in the northbound direction. And then the lines as you go to the right, up to the, uh, to the, the 13 minute mark, the 20 minute mark, even up to 20, 25 minutes. Those would be, yes. Oh, sure, no problem at all. Creeping forward a bit, I apologize. <laughs> um, so, so as you, um, as as you, what, what what you what this tells us is there, you get into a sense of the reliability of a trip. You expect to take 10 minutes or could it be 14 minutes or 15 minutes or 16 minutes? And you start to see, particularly uh, in, the, uh, in the northbound direction, there are some, there might be some periods where you hit where you, it, it could be a double uh, trip. You could take 20 minutes even. And this is the travel time um, on Wednesday and, and here's your travel time. On, uh, on Saturday. And again, you, you do see that, that spreading of the peak on Saturday. You're getting closer to capacity. Uh, you might have a time where you might cruise right through and it, it, it's smooth sailing. Other times, stopping at, 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 at multiple intersections in town um, due to any number of reasons, pedestrian activity, vehicle activity. So in the northbound direction, much more scattered Southbound, we, we saw to be a little bit more consistent. And these are um, the, the, the processing company that we use um, uh, is Myovision, and they, they send us these kind of pre recorded maps. So we couldn't kind of keep the y axis and the x axis the exact same to really compare apples to apples. But, but you do see some 20 minutes over on the southbound direction. So um, something to, or 40 minutes even. So a 10 minute trip. Could be a 20 minute trip, 30 minute trip, 40 minute trip. And then this is uh, Aqua to Cook Drive. So this is that 0.7 mile, less than a mile uh, trip. And you still see wide variety uh, um, in fairly inconsistent uh, uh, trips tend to be on that, 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 that high side, of course. And um, and probably a little more in the, in the northbound direction, a little more variability. Saturday, similar situation for the, this more shorter trip, um, more spread, more variability between, between uh, these two checkpoints. So with that, I was gonna jump kind of intersection by intersection. And a lot of this information fed into um, some of the 
observed field observations that, that Lauren and Brian saw out in the field as they're, they're looking focused in on signage and visibility and the pedestrian bicycle experience safety looking at the crash data this information helps um, feed into some of the conversation there about uh, what is the pedestrian activity are they crossing all over are they crossing right at the crosswalk are they um, what is that volume of pedestrians per day or per hour and then that might inform our decision on should we is there reasons to you know upgrade the crossing to a, a signal to other things uh, high visibility uh, and that that was a focus uh, of a lot of this information but also what's the vehicle activity doing uh, are there a lot of left turns right turns side street traffic andrew yes. just one quick question yes was the weather consistent all week long yeah, good so question. there were no events. Great, great question. Pretty, pretty, pretty uh, good weather all the way through. Uh, I think there was a little bit of a minor, you know, rain activity, and you know, during the week, but but pretty clear, pretty nice, beautiful weather. But that is a good question because that that definitely has an impact on on speeds and and um, travel time. And Andrew, do you know what the capacity in Kerala was? Uh, in terms of like the occupancy of, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that, but I, I think from information that we've received throughout peak season, it's been quite high. Um, this would be before that, uh, uh, the, the shoulder season sort of, sort of begins. So I would, I would imagine it'd be quite high. Question, question on, on, on the, um, uh, unless you were still talking about that question, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no go ahead. Um, when you're talking about the intersection turning this, this area, yes. are these actual crosswalks or actual intersections or both? Good question, good question. Um, I will kind of, event, we'll go through kind of each one and you can see exactly what's at each one. But it, in all of these cases, it was an intersection and a crosswalk. Okay, thank you. Uh, sometimes it was not uh, at, a, at, at a public intersection. It may, it may just be a, a driveway or, oh, okay. or something along those lines, um, like the Methodist Church driveway or you know, the Aqua driveway or some of the intersections. Got it. Um, uh, but again, we Wednesday, um, uh, the, the, we ran the, the cameras from Wednesday to, um, uh, to the following Wednesday. So we do have a seven, eight day period but we really only processed what we felt would be a good representative weekend and weekday day. So it was still the Wednesday before and then the following Saturday are the two um, data collection periods. We do have the video from the whole thing though, if we need to go back and look at anything, process more information later. And uh, this may be a little bit tough to read for you guys on the screen, but if you have the, the, the printouts, what this is is just a, a list of the, the uh, uh, intersections from, from Tuckahoe on the south end all the way down to, to uh, Sanderling at the northern end of town. And your maximum crossing uh, leg. So that's typically, typically there'd be one crosswalk at an intersection and that would be the, the leg that would have, you know, your maximum pedestrian volume. And you'll see sort of, as you kind of move down that first column that you see, Tuckahoe, um, you know, 100, 100 pedestrians were crossed during that 12 hour period, seven to seven a, same a.m. to p.m. And it really peaks at the Scarborough Lane driveway, and that's where the farmer's daughter is as well. Uh, over a, a thousand pedestrians crossed at that location. Christopher was, was, a, was a really large crossing um, with, with over 600 pedestrians counted, and these are you know, even if it was a you know, two people crossed at one time, this this is the total number of pedestrians and number of individuals. Uh, and then as you get to the edges of town, less crossing activity, as, as you imagine. Um, uh, Sanderling Resort at, at fairly low at the very northern end, region had very very little uh, crossing activity. Clearly, you know, in in the center of town, all the commercial activity. There's some instances of parking on one side and <coughs> destination on the other side of the road. A lot more, a lot more natural pedestrian crossing activities, and of course, a lot of wider part of the island with some homes and uh, just uh, pl plenty of destinations there. Okay, and then um, the next column over would be that pedestrian crossing that's 
walking parallel to NC12. So that's crossing the, the minor street. So we think of that, that, that path, the greenway on the, on the east side of the road through most of Duck. That tended to be the, the approach on the side that had the highest volume. And you would, that number is pretty consistent all through town, um, consistently high, I should say. Uh, the peak there is at, at Scarborough Lane as well, worth over a thousand pedestrians that are just going parallel to, to NC12. And, and you see, um, you, know, you see 900, 700, 700, 600, you know, huge, these are really large numbers um, for, for uh, you know, smaller community, just, just really remarkable. Um, how many, how much pedestrian activity, which is certainly a, a good thing. And um, on Saturday, the the actual pedestrian activity is, is quite a bit lower. I think there's a lot of rentals, people coming in, coming out, um, uh, those types of things as, as transitions are happening. Um, when you have higher volume activity, it's busy uh, in terms of the vehicle traffic, but there's actually less pedestrian activity that we can pick up on our in our cameras, uh, but but certainly still still quite 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 busy. All right, and then just a, a snapshot of when we trained our volunteers, and um, we we said you know, make a note of each time there's there's a, a stoppage, a queue, and and it, there, we we put as a, a in on their field sheet what we thought were pretty common reasons why traffic would be stopped. Um, sometimes it's 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 spilled back from something downstream, something around the corner. It just spills back into your hundred foot area that you're paying attention to. Uh, that would be our you know complete gridlock or a spillback issue. Um, you know pedestrians crossing would, was the other very common common one there. Sometimes it's a, a left turning vehicle, particularly when you don't have the center left turn lane. Of course, one left turning vehicle waiting for a gap in traffic. Would create a, a queue, a stop queue. Could be a right turning vehicle, could be parking maneuvers, uh, yielding to, to bicyclists, um, other, we had sort of other catch all category as well. And then those, we had a 90 minute period uh, on Wednesday from 11 to 12 30, so middle of the day where we expected a lot of pedestrian activity. And then on, on Saturday, similar. In the middle of the day, 12.30 to 2 o'clock was our observation period. And these are volunteers. So they were, uh, you know, had a, had a clipboard and, and they were out there. Um, you know, so it's it, it, sometimes you may have a, maybe a different observer at, at Wednesday or Saturday, but generally it was the same person. Um, and and th what this uh, chart will, will tell you, we kind of go from intersection 1 to 12, so Tuckahoe working our way north. And, and to the, the upper right tells you the pedestrian activity crossing each of the four legs. We just keep NC12, kind of your, your north-south um, vertical line there. And uh, for example, in that upper right, you have a zero where there's no pedestrians counted crossing the northern leg towards where the tennis courts are in the area, but you did have 113 on the southern leg towards, towards the, the pool. And then on the west leg, walking, uh, only seven pedestrians. However, on the right, uh, where you do have that, that path, the extra crosswalk, 500. And, um, and then down the, the below box is, is Saturday. So it's Wednesday pedestrians, and then Saturday pedestrians. And then over to the lower left is, is your bicycle activity on the road, and they're prominent mostly just going you know through at that point but you know there are nice uh, bike lanes in, in place and uh, you know, shoulder areas that are uh, they're used uh, by cyclists so you pay attention to that lower left for the bicycle activity and then the upper left is is our um, vehicular count so this would be uh, individual turning movements going straight left through straight from each of the different directions at these intersections. And the first number that you see is your, your AM peak, and then in parentheses is your PM peak, and then that would be, uh, and then the last number that's underlined would be a Saturday peak. 
and that's the the peak hour period. So that would be um, at at at, a, at your afternoon would be probably around four o'clock to five o'clock. Your morning peak, you know, in most you know, urban areas, it might be from seven seven to eight or seven thirty to eight thirty. Here it's later. It's beach communities, so it's probably more like eleven o'clock, ten o'clock. Um, and then Saturday is certainly right there in the middle of the day for the most part. But this is your highest vehicle hour uh, during the day. And at this particular location, you see fairly low side street activity um, from vehicles turning from Tuckahoe uh, Drive. Your left turn volume of less than 10, uh, uh, right turn volume of you know, 10 or below as well, and then fairly low volume. So it's really all, all traffic really just going through this intersection and that's fairly common. And then the last piece is that box in the middle. So these are what our, our observers noted. And during that 90 minute Wednesday period, the 90 minute Saturday period, uh, they counted the number of times there was a queue. And in this instance, there were 31 queues counted by our observers uh, that were due to yielding to pedestrian activity. In 11, uh, we're yielding to a left turn vehicle, a left turning vehicle. And this is a, a case where there is no left turn lane. So uh, most likely the, the left turning vehicle is waiting for a gap in traffic and then went and then, you know, then a, a short queue um, occurred as a result. So right here at this end, not too much queuing activity, um, roughly, roughly 52 and there might've been one or two in some of the other categories, but these were the two prominent um, reasons for the congestion. And then making our way uh, up to, to Plover Drive. This was an instance where um, looking at that box to the lower center there, um, very pretty much no queues uh, due to pedestrians. And then of course you look at the, the graphs to the right, there's very little crossing activity. This, this might be the one spot where there isn't a crosswalk across NC12, but there is one parallel to it. And that's where all your pedestrians are, 700 at Wednesday, 450 are using that long crosswalk at this location. But, uh, but here the congestion is not due to, the, to vehicles yielding pedestrians. It's really all left turning traffic or 45 that was just downstream congestion. So this would be something happening to the north that would create a, a spillback in the northbound um, direction that spill back into this intersection. Mm -hmm. So 45 queues were noted due to that, 11 due to, uh, due to left turning activity. Moving up to the aqua driveway, and that's where you, you, know, you have the speed um, detection there and it's telling drivers to really slow down to, to, to the, the uh, 25 mile per hour zone. At this location, um, I, the, where the volunteers observed here was um, on the Saturday northbound direction, 16 queues due to just downstream congestion from the village kind of making its way in, 15 due to left turning activity, 11 due to pedestrian activity. Uh, and in the southbound direction, it was um, more of a pedestrian, you know, fewer queues, but more on the pedestrian activity. And on Wednesday, um, uh, less kind of left turn and spillback, but it was more of a, the queues associated with pedestrians. So as we kind of move into the areas, into the village, you see a lot more um, you know, queues associated with, with cross, crosswalks and crossings as, as we'd expect, but it's certainly not, uh, certainly not all. A lot of the times it is due to vehicles turning left in or out. And uh, if you look at the, the cross, the pedestrian graph to the right, you see 16 cross north of the intersection, north of the yellow dot, and uh, 627 cross uh, at the uh, at the actually crosswalk itself. And that pattern is very very consistent, where it's not a case of pedestrians just cross everywhere. They they really do gravitate towards the, the crosswalks. And I think a lot of the treatments y'all have put in over the years have, have helped point pedestrians to where they should cross. And that's a good signal to drivers to, to expect that pedestrian activity. There could be a pedestrian walking through there and 
and Lauren and Brian will, will touch on sort of the yield compliance and what, what they observed as well. Are, are drivers really truly yielding to pedestrians or, or not? Uh, fair, could yes. I ask a quick question? Sorry, yes. I, and it may be not appropriate here, but this is the first time as we're looking at this data on, the, on as we're heading north that you have an actual turning lane. So wouldn't it, would, does that, um, you know, they have a mid lane where they can turn off of. So does that, that helps with the lefts too, I would imagine. Yes, that's a good point. Because the other areas don't have the left opening, I don't think. Yes, that, 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 that is a good point. Um, you know, and, and actually just, uh, just, just coming in here today, um, I was in the left turn lane and I was, had my turn signal on and the car was opposing and they, they hesitated and they sort of waved me in. There's, there's a lot of sort of courtesy gaps and, and that was a cue caused by a left turn, um, even though there is a left turn lane. <laughs> so I, I think you do see that a little bit and sometimes there might be spillback where um, even if there is a, um, a left turn lane, people will just stop, you know, we're not going that far that fast anymore. Yeah, just go you go ahead. ahead and clear out. We're gonna just jump to the queue that's already in front of us. Doesn't really affect a person's travel time any. Um, but that is a good good observation. And um, the, 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 on the vehicle side, when you start to see, um, you know, oh, 30 right turns off the, off the main line, that, that's probably among our higher you know, right, right turn volume. You know, if you have 50, 75, 100, and it's congested, you know, those are, ones where you start thinking about maybe we need a right turn lane to get a uh, get those cars off into their own space and that would allow another car behind it to proceed here you know there's such tight right away there's parking and there's not room for that there's some downside there's some negatives to it that we'll talk about later in terms of you know bicycles and, and crossing distances and things but uh, fairly low turning volumes at this location as well Okay, so this is uh, Scarborough um, Shopping Center. Uh, you know, that, that eastern leg kind of goes into the, the, the parking facility there. Uh, farmer starters on the on the west side, and over a thousand, well, twelve hundred and sixty three pedestrians use that crosswalk uh, during that twelve hour period we collected on Wednesday. Only twelve uh, crossed to the north, so it's a, a really really high percentage, obviously 99% that are that are using the crosswalk and very few not using it. And you see a similar trend on that Saturday where there's 935 across NC12, only 15 um, across an unmarked location. And walking on either side, up and down parallel to NC12, uh, 1,000 on the west side, 1,000 on the east side on Wednesday, and, you know, 900 and you know, six, six, 700 on the east side. So just constant stream, pretty steady stream of pedestrians um, right here in the, in the, in the core, probably really the center of, of a lot of your commercial district and, and uh, lots of destinations, lots of parking. And I think, I think business community um, expects that somebody might park in a parking lot and maybe walk over to that one and then maybe go to that business and then you know, I think there's a lot of people that will, um, you know, live here, but also visit and, and really just explore all the various destinations that you have in the village. Uh, so I would expect that that's part of it as well, or maybe there's more parking over here. Um, but I, I, that, that certainly, that was certainly a, a large contributor to it. The vehicle activity was, was certainly higher here. This was one where we thought might, might be one of the higher um, side street volumes. But still fairly, you know, fairly low entering and exiting. Um, it's not a case of exiting the business or long queues because uh, of so much demand. It's probably when you might have a bit of a queue leaving a business, it's because there's just a steady stream of traffic on NC12. You just really can't get a gap very easily. Um, and, and what the volunteers observed are, are 228 queues due to pedestrian activity. As you'd expect, that was the overwhelming majority, some due to the left turns, uh, 29, 11 due to right turns, uh, and then nine due to turns from the side street. So that would be uh, a little bit more where maybe somebody would wave out a, 
car from the side and they, they come out. Um, but that's the, uh, this was a location that, that, that Brian and, and Lauren definitely focused in on and observed this was one of the busier spots as well. Uh, just just shortly, just a short distance up is Christopher Drive, and this was our, our second highest uh, crossing location and very similar trends, um, 626 pedestrians crossing to the south, uh, only two crossing north of the intersection, uh, 528 on Saturday, that lower right box to seven. So um, just, just, a, just a huge amount of compliance in terms of going to the crosswalk and then a, a lot of just walking up and down um, in C12, uh, safely on the side there. Uh, and your, your, your bicycle activity is, is you know, 100, so you know, good steady stream. And that, those, some of those numbers are pretty, pretty consistent as well. And uh, a, a lot of left side street volume, but, but still not um, one of the measures that, that um, traffic engineers use is if there's like a hundred left turning vehicle or a hundred vehicles coming off the side street, you know, that's, that's a, one of the, what we call a peak hour warrant for meeting a, a signal. And, um, you know, this was one of those locations that we were curious whether this would meet a warrant for, for signalization. And on the, from a vehicle standpoint, side street vehicle warrant, it's still below that. Um, that that's not to say that, uh, uh, they're not considered in areas that don't strictly meet the, the vehicle warrant. If there's crash history or some other reasons, uh, pedestrian activity that, to put one in, I mean, that, that's certainly on the table. Okay, so then uh, moving a, a little bit further north. So this is the, the boardwalk, a crosswalk and a private vehicle uh, access uh, to the east, a small shopping center there. Um, no, no pedestrians crossing north of the intersection. They're all, you know, right there at the uh, at the crosswalk. And of course, that's what gets you towards the boardwalk, uh, which is your your destination there. And in this instance, there was a little bit more left turning activity. Um, so rather than it being almost all, over all due to yielding to pedestrians, there's a fair amount of left turns. So 74 queues observed due to pedestrians, 33 due to the lefts, and uh, you know, some, some amount of activity from a hesitation for vehicles to, to exit the side street. So uh, moving, moving on up to, to Duck Landing, uh, right here at Town Hall. Um, here was an instance where we saw um, you know, the observations noted uh, 34 queues due to pedestrian activity, 12 from, from downstream activity. And that would be that, that spill back that, that made it, made its way into the, uh, into this intersection. So that's kind of a, a queue spill back from downstream, but it was only in the southbound direction. I think northbound right here, folks are able to kind of flush out and clear. They're, they're sort of exiting this, down, this downtown village area. More of a, it's more of a southbound issue and then some cues related to, to left turns and then 11 cues due to you know our other category and you know those that those other categories they would note what might be happening there was you know an instance of a fire truck um, there was a little bit of um, you know turns coming from the side street sometimes it was a car that was just stopped I think this one the person said they had question marks and they like said people just stop for no reason. No, they have no idea why, <laughs> um, which that happens too. I, you know, you look at your phone, you don't know where you're going. You're, there's a lot of tourists. <laughs> Sometimes they just stop. Um, so that was, that was what they noted here. Um, and then your bicycle activity was, was you know, pretty steady, 100. Um, you know, northbound, southbound, uh, along on the street there. Okay, it's going to Ridge and then United Methodist Church is, is over to the, on the west side. Um, our, our pedestrian activity is quite a bit lower through here, but it's still 177 using that crosswalk on Wednesday, 20 on Saturday, 
and then you're starting to see the volumes on the side street slow down as or lower as well. So uh, 400 on the west leg, five, almost 600 on the east leg, and it, and it drops quite a bit on Saturday through here. Um, your, your turn, turning volumes um, from Schooner Ridge were fairly low. So the total hourly volume uh, in the uh, in the morning was just only 35 exiting. And in the, uh, in the afternoon peak, um, you know, roughly you know, 34 exiting. So well less than that 100 that you would start thinking about a peak hour warrant for a signal based on volume activity alone. Uh, 24 right turning vehicles, so you know, decent number of right turning vehicles, but you know things like right turn lanes. Um, you know, really the the, the yielding they they, don't, they typically can, can turn into a uh, into a driveway or an intersection without too much hesitation. Where you might see some issues is if there's a parking space that's like right there, just inside an intersection. Maybe somebody's backing up, then you see us go back into the into the um, into the street, and we, we really try to keep that internal pro stem protected uh, that for driveways, so that vehicles can kind of get off the public street, so they don't create congestion potential for a rear end crash. Uh, but you know, some of these are very narrow sites, uh, and uh, uh, they're maximizing their parking, so there's not a lot of space to always just clear into a, an intersection and and. Um, Sometimes they are diving straight into a parking space. And, and actually, I think the next one, uh, actually two up from here, parking was part of the, the congestion that, that people uh, observed. So this is Cook Drive. Uh, again, the crosswalk, you know, roughly almost just less than 200 on Wednesday, less than 169. And then you see the total number of queues really slowing down through here. The volumes are less as you get north of town. 31 due to pedestrians, 12 due to uh, downstream congestion. That was something that was happening around the corner. Um, but they, they, they couldn't, couldn't really see, but it was spilling back into the, uh, to their observation zone. And uh, here you had a little bit of, you know, cues due to right turns as well. So that popped up at this location. Could be a, a, a right turning vehicle yielding to a pedestrian or, or just going, going slow through there creates a bit of a, a stopped queue. Side street volumes, you know, 20, 30, uh, it's fair, fairly low turning out. And, and you still have your left turn lane through here, but lifts in and off the major aren't very, aren't very high. Okay, so now we're, 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 we're just getting kind of north of town at, at, at Sunset Grill, and they have the parking lot on the, on the east side, the restaurant up against the water on the west side. Here's where you had 12 queues due to pedestrian activity, and I remember, um, you know, one of the one of the observers. It was like a Cisco truck bringing, you know, bringing uh, material, uh, food to the uh, to the site, and it kind of created some congestion there. Um, some of it was just slowly parking. One was uh, somebody dropping off at the restaurant, you know, and then creates a bit of a queue. So just a lot of. That's where we get into sort of solutions to improve traffic that are in that category of managing traffic or if, if there's ways that uh, businesses can load unload you know off the road on their property have designated spaces as you're um, you know reviewing site plans and development plans that they can clear the road <laughs> um, that definitely helps traffic flow a little little bit smoother through but um, but also a lot of uh, rather than it Pedestrians really being the dominant source, um, although still a high number, you know, 18 were due to left turning activities, typically uh, in the northbound direction. So probably a southbound left turn where there isn't a turn lane now. Moving, uh, there's two more intersections left. So 11 and 12, so Widgeon Drive, very little pedestrian activity across. Uh, it was just really a couple of homes on the west side. So not, not, the, not the logical, uh, high pedestrian destinations, um, and you do have some users of the uh, of the side path there, about 452, and uh, uh, in the on Saturday 285. So, um, you know the, the the total activity is down a little bit, but uh, whatever is out there tends to be just moving parallel to NC12. Uh, your pedestrian activity or your bicycle activity definitely dropped out. Uh, dropped off quite a bit up here. 
um, just just more you know, 17, 15, um, you know, less than 30 over the course of that that 12 hour period that we observed, and then uh, fairly low turning activity for vehicles. So these are instances where vehicles could probably turn left in or out pretty easily up here as, as the volumes are reduced. And our last intersection is, is up at the Sanderling Resort. And here, uh, there's an instance where there's probably a little more people crossing um, outside of the crosswalk. Mm -hmm. uh, you see 44 used the crosswalk, 12 were crossing you know, to the south. And then on Saturday, it's 84 and, and 13. And I think it has to be with with where you park and where the door is in the building on either side and people are you know find the shortest path sometimes i think there was a lot of that going on um, and then walking parallel to nc12 239 and 163 so yeah, still decent numbers there but much lower than what we were seeing down in the village uh, the turns in and out are, were fairly low as well so this is just a, a summary of, of, of all of those 12 locations um, and what those observers noted for all the various causes. And, and this is just a snapshot. It was just a period on Wednesday, a period on Saturday. There could be, you could count on a different day. It might be something a little bit different, but I think we're comfortable that, to say that this was pretty, would be pretty common on the other days as well. But, um, but on Wednesday, without a doubt, with the pedestrian activity being higher and, and it's you know 450 is that bar on, on either graph. On Wednesday, that, that B category of pedestrians crossing, and you can probably add that small bar next to it, and that's pedestrians crossing just outside the, outside of the crosswalk, was, was the uh, accounted for the, the bulk of, of the total queues there. Uh, second place there would be um, left turning vehicles or the, the lower the other cause for, for slowdowns, queues, and then, um, you know, some kind of downstream spillback that would be that first category uh, of complete gridlock. And then there'd be some level of, of other activity. We had them note if there was you know, carts, and you know, we hear a lot about scooters and golf carts and things like that. And that did show up, but it was not a huge number. It was more of an isolated observation here or there where, where maybe somebody was yielding to a, a golf cart, but that was not a, a real prominent um, reason for congestion through there. And then really kind of our, our, our last slide, and, and a lot of what this is focused in on is like, let's get the data, let's get the information, let's try to understand what the problem is first, uh, and, and then we can, with that, with that information, we can really start to Evaluate any number of things in more detail, and 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 Lauren and Brian are definitely going to get into some of the some of that in the, in the following presentation. But just kind of a quick snapshot of of, of 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 things that we could consider, things that we could talk about, things that you guys could take a look at um, in, in terms of your general, you know, how you how you how you handle the congestion, or or can you do something about the congestion, or or are the downsides to it worse than, than could improve the congestion, but could, could uh, negatively affect like, the character of the area and so forth. And, um, and what comes to mind, I guess, first was um, the big one was, you know, was the Mid-Kirtuck Bridge. What, what will that do? There's folks for and against it. And I, I was just taking a look at, at, the, at what that net impact was and that traffic study was published a few years ago and um, without a doubt uh, something like a 16,000 cars a day in the no build and their 2040 was forecasted up to 27 and then it drops to, to 19 uh, uh, with that bridge in place and then looking at summer weekday summer weekend they hit different time categories that was the trend it was kind of today's volumes growing to, to the future with development, growth, things that are happening next to you guys. And then, it, and then with, and then when that bridge comes into place, that, that 18 and up to 30 in the future, but with the bridge, it went down to 22. So that's the, and then the, the, the summer weekend was, was the highest, went from 24 to 40, down to 22. Um, so 
one takeaway was that the bridge is probably going to, to if it comes, when it comes, uh, there's still a lot of certain uncertainty there. You'll see that reduction in traffic um, relative to what it could be, but it's still gonna be probably higher than what you have today. Um, so that future build, even with the bridge, will, will still be uh, an increase in volume of what you have today. And I think, you know, your other trends with COVID, there's some other things that have happened recently with people, second homes here more often. There, there's some interesting other side effects that I think could contribute to slightly different uh, outcome. But so the mid career truck bridge was one thing. One thing that we, you know, just, just I've mentioned it before, you know, things like turn lanes. I don't, I don't think there's a lot of interest in, in adding pavement, adding, lane, adding a, say, a, an extra southbound through lane, extra northbound through lane certainly affects the character of the town. Um, those, but those would be traditional traffic recommendations. Um, so signalized pedestrian crossings at, at, at major locations, that's something that, that, um, that, that, that Lauren will talk about. There's some advantages, disadvantages. Uh, it's not a necessarily a fix to traffic. Um, uh, it could clump the pedestrians into more of a group to then cross them all at one time. So like a platoon of pedestrians. So then you could flush out the through traffic. But at the same time, we, as we talked about it, uh, you know, there's a, it's probably a marginal impact, but you could end up with more pedestrians crossing at different locations. <laughs> you could, they could, uh, they could ignore the signal and just cross. Um, we didn't feel like that would be a, you know, certainly not a silver bullet, but it, it would have some, some benefit, but there's some, advantages and disadvantages of that one in each location has slightly different volumes and characteristics but that could also be modeled as well um and then you know well, what about removing <coughs> removing crosswalks and, and i think you know removing crosswalks the you don't remove the pedestrian demand the demand is there and they're going to cross and i think we're of the mindset that you'd want to make it visible to pedestrians make sure people can see it make sure Every, the, the visibility of both the driver and pedestrian is clear. Um, and, um, you know, or, or there's the, the notion of adding, you know, maybe we need to add um, crosswalks. You know, that could, maybe if you have a thousand crossing at one point, you could potentially split that into, you know, 800 and, and 400 of the 1200, or, uh, you know, that could theoretically make some slightly more gaps in traffic, which could have a slightly, benefit, but it has to do with where your destinations are, what your infrastructure is leading into it. Um, you know, placing traffic guards, traffic coordinators, I think the, the staff mentioned that some folks had some ideas there and um, that becomes a bit of a tricky exercise because this is not just a one hour period or a two hour period. What, what our numbers are telling us is that on Saturday, it is just a steady stream of traffic and frankly, the pedestrian activity, and we can do it you know, an hourly chart it, it, from, from really when that's the weather, the sun is up, people are out. And as these businesses open, some of them are open in the evenings, but when the businesses are open, the activity is there. And I think people do walk um, across the street and they visit a lot of destinations in one, in one shop and things like shuttles, things like that are, 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 are some ideas. Um, Improving local connectivity with parallel to NC12. That's a, just just to throw out options. I mean, that's another one that we had to add to the list. But most of our parallel perpendicular streets to NC12 are, you know, they're residential. They they dead end. It's just that's the common style here. If you were to connect a few of them, maybe you get a few more people choosing to to take other routes. But then you may introduce you know, cut through traffic, people avoiding congestion, zooming through. Neighborhood. So there's certainly downsides, um, uh, Southern Shores, others that do have more parallel routes to NC-12. I felt some negative, negative effects of, of that type of cross-section. Um, you know, and other things like travel demand management, things that can adjust the, the demand for vehicles. And that, that gets into strategies like, um, you know, rentals that are on Sunday to Sunday rather than Saturday to Saturday to help knock down this Saturday demand or uh, adjusting uh, major events or other types of activities to try to offset when the peak periods are. Um, managing the road itself with trash collection, uh, with with other types of um, you know trucks that like the 
Cisco truck that's that's right there in the middle of the you know of the road, trying to avoid that at all costs. Um, any other types of things that that contribute to um, congestion, and, and some of it could be as simple as sign clutter, sign too much signage, or, or bad visibility, and just folks, everyone is kind of wants to slow down uh, in in that area. So we have to be mindful of that. But um, but with that, uh, any any kind of general general questions or other information? Uh, it's a lot of a lot of numbers that I threw at you, but I think this is, and we're gonna compile a report and I think this will be useful as you guys are looking at specific spots you, you have the data you have the information and if somebody who lives on the street is like well what's happening at my we have that information we'll share it in a format that you guys will pull up as, as needed to help you know dive into that a little bit more multi-angled approach that you did it's really interesting thank you for walking us through it I don't have any specific questions. I guess the one observation I would make is there's no quick and easy solution to the traffic. <laughs> I wish there was. <laughs> you know, I, I wish there it's was. It's great data. I mean, uh, well, there, there's 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 things there's things there that that would could help, but at the same time, that there's negative consequences to it, um, and and a lot of what Brian and Lauren will look at. You know, if the speeds were up five miles an hour, you know, through town, um, you know, there is a, a a downside to the people who the comfort of pedestrians walking next to the road. And and you know, you've used I think every inch of asphalt very in a very smart manner out there. And how much space you've given to vehicles, how much you've given to the cyclists, that you've been able to fit in a planting strip that provides a little bit of separation. There's not a lot of spare. We could maybe, you know, if you had a little bit extra foot here or there, that you could could at help help in marginal ways from a capacity standpoint. But it's certainly not a a big a big change. Um, you know, where where you have a three lane section as you get a little further out of town, if you had another left turn lane in, in a couple of spots where there is some left turn congestion, that that could help a little bit. But it's not a, you know, it's not a or laning the road <laughs> yeah. type solution. In the Mid-Kirtuck Bridge, it, it did have a pretty, looking at the, tra the traffic studies that have been conducted on it, uh, that, that does definitely has an effect as, as folks are say leaving areas north of you and in, in the county, in Kirtuck County, and they can hit the mainland a lot faster and easier. You know, that'll relieve some of that, that pressure uh, coming through town. Any additional questions for Andrew? Well, I think you, you mentioned on your analysis of the Currituck Bridge traffic, which is nice to hear it analyzed with, you know, someone who is a professional in that field. But you were saying that, um, yes, it would bring the traffic down, but the projections show by 2040 that it's going to be way up higher, yeah. even with the bridge is what, and that's just due to um, the build out of Kerala, I'm guessing. That is correct. And, and um we do get involved with with traffic forecasting and a lot of what goes into that type of study is looking ahead at what the population projections are what the visiting projections are looking at the different seasonal variations and uh, estimating and that's input that's provided from local planners conversations understanding what ncdot projects might be coming what development might be coming and generally traffic has has you know steadily will steadily go up over time and uh, and that's what 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 it takes so long to build a bridge and uh, it was my previous study my previous company did that 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 document and I, and I i remember working on the mid career tech study about 15 years ago so <laughs> it has been going on for you guys probably longer than that that, that that's been yeah. an idea so, um, but over time, you know, we have we build models and things like that 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 are tools. But it's uh, it's still just because projects take so long to to get built, particularly ones that have so many um, environmental challenges, other challenges like like anything at the coast would have. Um, that's what we do. So so then by the time we get to that design year, you know, we have the infrastructure in place to to accommodate that future demand. Um, but yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, that's, 
you know, that, I think that's in a lot of folks' mind, particularly you know, north of you and, and, and you know, along the stretch of NC-12 is that's sort of the, one of the, the, the gorillas in the room. What is that going to do and how will that affect your community and, and the adjacent communities to the mm -hmm. north and south? Yeah, because so, so earlier in the data, when you were presenting, you really kind of showed us, even though we weren't in peak summer, we were operating pretty much at capacity on the road already right yeah, now. Yeah, certainly on your Saturday, you're, you're there. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that doesn't mean complete gridlock, but what it does mean is when there are hesitations, mm -hmm. Any there's a ripple variable. effect. Yeah. That, that before you know it, a, uh, a, a six minute trip turns into an eight minute trip or a 10 minute trip or if, 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 if somebody even stops in the road to let somebody out to a restaurant and, and chats for a little bit or sees a neighbor and, and, and it's a, just a 30 seconds, you created a, a ripple effect that could, could go a half mile back <laughs> when you're close to capacity. Now, uh, you know, in February, no problem, yeah, right? You scrap right. your cars and then we'll clear out right away. But um, when you're near capacity, that's what that means. It just takes it just takes a little bit to, to set us off. So whatever whatever we can control um, and, and prevent, you know that, that that that's what our strategies are. You know, he heavy heavy rain events, other things are going to happen. Special events, and then you know that those are July Fourth weekend. I mean, there's there's going to be times that uh, I, I think most locals know to probably not drive anywhere on certain days and. Uh, and, and that's sort of your travel demand side. Yeah, thank you. If, if that bridge is built, what percentage of traffic do you think will use the bridge that are in Corolla or north of Duck? It's a good question. Uh, they, they have um, what's, uh, I just really took kind of a quick skim through it, but they have what's called like an origin destination mm -hmm. where you have lots of different points and then they have a, a table. I could dig into that and, and give you that, that information because it's, even I've kind of thought through, well, maybe you have a few less people that are north of you that are heading south or, or leaving or heading back up to the north to Virginia or, you know, they're not passing through these roads anymore. But you might have some new southern shore traffic <laughs> that is now uh, coming through town that, that didn't come through town before. Uh, I think a lot of, you know, the traffic here is, is, is through traffic, but there's destinations here, as you know. I mean, it's, it's a you're, you're in the Outer Banks for seven days and you're going to go to, <laughs> to different spots. Duck is one of those de destinations for a lot of a lot of people, um, along with the Wright Memorial and Jockey's Ridge and all the other other things. So it, 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 I can but I can I can dive, take a dive, deeper dive into that. Thank you. Andrew, I guess my um, I'm not quite sure how to ask this question, but I've lived here since 95 and this pattern, this is a known pattern. I mean, the volume is different, but this is this is exactly what was happening in 95. It's just there's more cars now. What wasn't happening in 95 that's happening now is that we actually have a pedestrian infrastructure and the pedestrians are doing exactly what we wanted them to do, which is use the boardwalk, walk on the sidewalks, cross at the crosswalks and walk and walk into town. And I, so my question is, is there any way to look at the pedestrian numbers and get a sense of how many cars aren't on the road because people are walking instead of driving, which they used to. Anytime they had to go anywhere, their only option was to drive. Yeah. Because they had to, well, I re, you remember, Monica, I mean, you had to walk in the shoulder, if there even was one, and um, it, was uns it was really unsafe. Yeah, uh, that's what I was, I was just kind of looking at before the meeting. One, one interesting thing that might get to that question, um, NCDOT publishes uh, average annual traffic uh, all over the state system. And, and I was just looking at, and this is a spot north of town, um, and in 2002, and this is annualized, so it's not summer, it's, it's, it's an annual average, uh, 11,000 cars a day uh, in 2002. 2003, 11,000. 2004, 11,000. It dipped to 9,900. Um, so from 2002 to 
2007, it was pretty consistently 11,000. And then at, in 08, down to 95, mm -hmm. 09, 10, 11, 12, 55. And I know part of it, there was the recession. Yeah. And, um, but, but 5,500, 6,500, 7,900. In 2012, 5,300, 2013, 6,800, and now it's back up to, in 2017, 9,900. So it's like the volume, if we look back 20 years, has been actually pretty flat. It dipped, and it, it might have been, the, you know, in the market, the housing market and other things, and the visitor, you know, visitors' um, occupancies might have been affected by that. But it, we're kind of, the total volume hasn't, change that much and that might be part of uh, people using you know using that infrastructure walking more I mean, if you're in if you want to go a half mile and, and duck the weather's beautiful um yeah i think people are more inclined now uh probably than even then to to make that trip uh, via walking or, or bike well the other thing too that's different is that you know in 95 uh a, a four or 5,000 square foot house was a big house. And maybe that was two vehicles, maybe three. Now, you know, some of, as the houses get bigger, it takes more vehicles. And um, so there's just, there may not be more rental units or more housing units, but there's certainly more cars. So. Yeah, yeah I do think there might be um, a little bit into the, uh you know how, how the rental how that, that that market has changed but but um and i do think you see more you know, second homes that are actually occupied more often mm -hmm. uh during the year and that, that could add up in their off-peak periods um but but occupancies i, I suspect are quite mm -hmm. full yeah every year and um and, you know that definitely has an effect thank you for presenting it any other discussion or comments for andrew Andrew, thank you very much. Sure. Appreciated the presentation. Thanks. Very nicely done. Joe? Yeah, item number two, virtual presentation, discussion of pedestrian crosswalk study by Brian Mayhew with NCDOT and Lauren Blackburn with VHP. Well, uh, good afternoon. I'm Brian Mayhew. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay, great. So um, I'm joining you guys from, from Raleigh today and appreciate the opportunity to share the results of, of our review. Um, I'm the state traffic safety engineer with NCDOT and I manage several uh, safety programs for the department. Um, of course, one of our focus areas is pedestrian safety. And, and after talking some with the town and division one, we agreed to, to do a review um, of your, your town, and we reviewed NC-12 throughout the, uh, the full length of your town, of course, with a lot of focus in, in the village area. And Lauren Blackburn uh, worked with me on this uh, study. She's from VHB as well. So this was kind of a separate effort than the information that you just received, but it was coordinated with that as well. So, um, but it was, um, it, it was it, you know, it was a, a uh, we were able to visit in mid-August um, the, uh, the primary focus was pedestrian safety. So while we acknowledge the capacity issues and the challenges with the traffic, the, the review focus on pedestrian safety, especially looking at those interactions between pedestrians, cyclists, and vehicles uh, during those peak hours and um, at all the crosswalk uh, locations, we did review every crosswalk location and we did look at the, the driveway um, areas and, and all between the crosswalks as well. So um, with that, we're gonna go through, I'll, I'll mention a few general findings. And then after that, Lauren uh, will introduce herself and she will go through uh, in a good bit more detail of um, some of what our observations were. But like we've already talked about and, and Andrew shared, pedestrian activity is, is very steady and very high. Um, I have done work all across the state uh, on pedestrian safety and you know, some of the volumes that we uh, observed and, and measured um, are quite high. So that's, that's to, to say a lot to your town. Um, you've put in the infrastructure, you've 
put in uh, places that people want to walk to, and and they and you know they they are. Um, I think the multi-use path might be something that's um, um, might. You know, I know it was mentioned the changes between 1995 and now that multi-use path is is an attractor, right? It is it is something that definitely really helps as a conduit of, of people north and south through town and then allows them to cross the street wherever wherever they need to. So um, and again, with some of our general findings, I will say that overall yielding, pedestrian yielding is a challenge. We face this challenge all over the state, but in your town, uh, pedestrian yielding, yielding between vehicles and pedestrians at crosswalks is very, very high. And that corresponds to having um, uh, safety and that helps pedestrians feel comfortable. And that probably helps them um, make that decision on whether to drive somewhere and walk somewhere as well. So congratulations, that's good. Um, I think the, the congestion that you're experiencing um, you know, it's uncomfortable uh, without a doubt. Um, it does serve to moderate speed. Um, speeds are fairly low during most, most times of the day. And, you know, that also helps with pedestrian safety and it helps those drivers make that decision on, on yielding to pedestrians as well. Um, as already mentioned by Andrew, you know, the congestion definitely, it, minor disruptions can have a big impact when you have volumes that high. Uh, a lot of turning vehicles in and out of the businesses, uh, pedestrians crossing, uh, cyclists as well, um, you know, turning movements at, at those intersections, all those uh, were noticed to create, um, my, you know, um, minor disruption, uh, you know, disruptions, but, but significant because of the queuing. Um, we definitely witnessed, as Andrew pointed out as well, that a uh, um, you know, the vehicles were allowing gaps for drivers to turn in and out of driveways and side streets as, as well. And so the, the general yielding nature of kind of taking turns, whether it's pedestrians or other vehicles was definitely, definitely present. You know, crosswalks um, uh, are spaced about every 380 to 420 feet throughout your, your village. And uh, that seems to be working. Um, we don't think that any should be removed because the demand is so high. And if you remove those crosswalks, then more than likely you're going to start introducing pedestrian activity um, in places where you don't have crosswalks. They're going to start crossing um, outside of those, you know, those zones, and and um, it's still going to cause yielding, but it's perhaps le less safe. So there's some visibility challenges because of the the some of the conflicts between how vehicles position themselves to turn into some of the businesses that can shield a pedestrian crosswalk. And the reason that might be an issue is one, safety, but, but in this case, it can cause um, a sudden stop by a vehicle uh, because they, they didn't see the ped and then suddenly they do. And so they, they're dri driving at a slow enough speed where they're able to stop. But that sudden stop can also cause a more significant disruption in, in your traffic flow. So we did observe that in some of our recommendations, we'll make a few comments um, about that as the things that, that may, um, may could be done or at least considered. So with that, I'm gonna let Lauren introduce herself and, uh, and then go through in a little bit more detail. Good afternoon. Um, can you all see the screen okay? I'm assuming you can because uh, Brian was able to talk through it. Good, great. Um, Lauren Blackburn also with BHB. And uh, as Brian mentioned, this was a, a parallel but separate review process. We didn't uh, use data as much as what Andrew had shared, but what we really relied on was those observations that we made in the field. And, and we did look at some of the data just to confirm that, you know, the, the patterns that we were assessing were consistent with what uh, the data was, was demonstrating. Um, I'm also in Raleigh and um, I'm a planner by training. So i um, glad to be with you guys. And as Brian mentioned, I'm going to go location by location. They are Many of the same locations that Andrew went through, but then we have many additional locations because we we looked at each of the crosswalks and a few other locations uh, where pedestrian crossings were either potential or likely. So, uh, beginning with some of the crash information, I won't go through all the numbers, but you know it's a 
we, we pull this information to help us understand uh, what the patterns are, if there are patterns, what types of crashes may be contributing to, to some of the, the safety problems in particular. And uh, as many people have noted already, you have um, you know, substantial pedestrian and bicycle traffic in, in Duck. And with that is the exposure, there's the more likelihood for crashes. So there are a number of pedestrian and bicycle crashes. Uh, we looked at each of those just to understand if there were some consistent crash types that were contributing. Um, nothing really standing out for the bike and ped crash types per se, uh, but there was certainly a relationship between those pedestrian crashes and when rear end crashes for vehicles were occurring at the crosswalk. So that really kind of supports what Brian just said is that there may be some relationship between uh, a vehicle approaching from behind another vehicle that's yielding to a pedestrian in the crosswalk suddenly coming to a stop because they didn't see the pedestrian. So there's maybe things that we can do better to improve visibility at the crosswalk and of the pedestrian in advance of that approach. Um, geographically, where the crashes have occurred, you know, they are they are distributed widely across the entirety of Duck, but mostly in the village um, part of the community. Um, bicycle crashes were predominantly at intersections like Scarborough and Christopher. That's that's very consistent with what we see in other parts of the state. That bicycle crashes more often happen at intersections where vehicles are interacting with the bicycle movements more so, but pedestrian crashes are occurring along the length of it. So nothing really um, standing out there in the way of clusters of, of pedestrian crashes per se, but definitely where there are some of those turning movements. So uh, because the, the community is, is, is very long, physically speaking, uh, we broke it up into three sections. So um, we've got a section that is essentially north of the village, a section B, which is essentially the, the core of the village, and then section C, which is um, south of the village. So I'm going to go through each of these starting from north and then moving my way south. And I'll just work intersection or crosswalk by crosswalk. I'll go through a lot of these pretty quickly. You know, just um, uh, let me know if you want to want me to pause and explain anything further. So starting from the north, uh, we looked at the, the crosswalks near the Sanderling Resort, as well as those crosswalks that are south of, of Sanderling and approaching the village. Um, and then we've looked at some of the, you know, in, along the way, of course, there are other intersections where there are not marked crosswalks, uh, just trying to make some determination if there may be some need for additional crosswalks. Essentially, we have not, uh, we're not recommending any additional crosswalks in this section of the village, but rather we're really looking at ways to enhance uh, the visibility at those existing marked crosswalks and especially as folks are commuting or coming towards the um, crosswalks on the north from Kerala, um, just to, to increase that expectation. Um, as you all know, the speeds along this section vary based especially on season. Um, and, and that plays into some of our recommendations about what would be the, the appropriate treatment for a crosswalk based on some of those expected speeds. But you know, as everybody has really been mentioning today that speeds for the most part, especially in the village are, are, um, are managed or are um, being you know, re relegated to an extent because of the traffic congestion. Um, we, we looked at, at issues along the roadway. We didn't pay a, as much attention to the side path crossings or the condition of the side path. Uh, we really focused very much on the crosswalks, but a few, uh, a few comments on some of the um, you know, conditions of the side path, um, especially on the Northern section. You know, one minor thing that we noticed is that the, some portions of the pathway um, the, the material changes, you all know this. So a lot of this probably has to go back to some of the sections you needed to replace for different reasons. It can create um, an uncomfortable riding experience for cyclists in particular. And so there were a couple occasions where we observed a cyclist choosing to, to get off the pathway where either the, the physical condition maybe was a little rougher or the, the path was narrowed and they, they definitely seemed to know what they were doing. They would you know, exit the pathway fairly quickly, then rejoin it. So that can create a safety problem for cyclists, but you know, for the most part, we saw people doing that only when they really knew what was ahead. So it seemed to be for that more local um, cyclist. So approaching from the north, um, the two crosswalks at the resort. Um, 
that both of those crosswalks have been there for um, some time and you know they each have the LED lighting in, embedded within that. Um, a couple things that we've we've noticed or recommended is that the, the signs themselves could be replaced with more reflective signage, um, especially because you're coming into this area rather, you know, suddenly after having gone through the section between this and Kerala. And also for that same reason, um, it may be a good idea to install a sign in advance of the section coming from the north. And then you'll see later a recommendation um, to, to do the same thing, essentially approaching from the south to give the driver a heads up that in, you know, in a certain amount of distance, maybe a couple hundred feet in advance of those crosswalks, that they should expect pedestrian activity for the next mile or so. So that's just a, a general recommendation with some signage. And then the other thing that you'll hear me mention many times today is where there is no overhead lighting at a marked crosswalk, that um, that should be installed at those marked crosswalks. So that, that applies to these crosswalks north of the village, as well as to a couple crosswalks south of the village. There are um, four locations south of Sanderling, but before you get into the village where there are crosswalks um, at uh, Royal Turn, Ruddy Duck, Gannett and Quail Way, um, those signs are also um, in older warning signs probably need to be replaced so that they're more reflective, need overhead lighting. And then also coming from the south, just like what I mentioned for the um, northern approach to Sanderling, installing a sign a couple hundred feet in advance of that um, southernmost crossing to, to indicate that the driver should expect pedestrian crossings for approximately the next 1.2 miles. So that would be closest to that paper canoe um, establishment. So if you can kind of imagine, we're essentially recommending that this be established as a pedestrian zone, um, just to enhance some of that awareness on the driver's part. But no additional crosswalks at this point are being recommended. All right, um, for the section in the middle, the village, um, we looked at each of the crosswalks and a couple other locations just uh, because of some of the expected pedestrian activity. Um, I'll go again through those starting from the north and working our way south. Um, this is the slower speed posted um, section of the community, as you all know. Um, there are side path in, on both sides or sidewalk on both sides for most of it, but there's also some gaps in the infrastructure, but we've, we've since learned from talking with the town staff and others that you all are working on that. You're working on extending some of that network um, to really complete that as much as possible on both sides. So that's, that's really good, new, good news because that's going to help um, uh, improve the um, extent to which pedestrians are willing to cross at the places where you want them to. And as Brian mentioned earlier, you know, yielding rates in the village are exceptional um, compared to virtually anywhere else in the state. So um, it's already working very well. So we have some minor recommendations at locations in this section, but you know, for the most part, again, this is really about enhancing visibility. Um, at the first one, moving um, south, this is at the Sunset Grill location. So I'm sure you all are familiar. There's a refuge island. Um, the refuge island serves multiple purposes. Um, it helps um, indicate to the driver that they're, in, they're entering a space where they should be slowing down. Um, that's more consistent with the reduced speed limit. Um, the bicycle uh, network changes at the same location. It transitions uh, from that, what we call a buffered bike lane into that, um, the, the shoulder space for bike lanes, as well as having that wider path, which begins at that point moving north. Um, there is overhead lighting at this crosswalk, and um, you know I think especially when the network is built on the sound side of, of this section, that's going to make this crosswalk even more prominent. Um, the, the issues that we, we found here are really more about how the bicyclist is expected to travel and, and maybe some ways to improve some of the ways that bicyclists are um, transitioning between some of these different bike facilities. So for example, right now, if you're a bicyclist um, on the side path coming from the north, um, and then you, you need to make some decisions about transitioning to on-road bicycling travel, uh, the signs in some cases are a little obscured behind the light pole, and you don't have that advanced warning as you're approaching it to make some decisions. So some things like um, a bike lane ends 
sign coming from the, the south approaching north, and then the opposite direction, a sign indicating to the cyclist on the pathway that they, that they will also um, be transitioning to a bike lane at that point. So some signage options could, be, um, could really help communicate bicycle travel here. Um, the lighting uh, at the location is good. Uh, we saw good compliance. So really this is, is more about bicycle travel at this location. The next crosswalk to the south is um, just south of Dune Road. Um, and a special thanks to the town staff. Uh, they went out and got a couple of drone footage photos for us at a couple locations where, um, you know, it, it be, we needed to really have that clarity. So here, uh, the, aerial, the aerial map was taken by the town as part of that zone, that drone footage. Um, at this location, as you all know, the sidewalk transitions, um, stops on the, on the sound side, but we know that that's part of the planned improvements. Um, you've got the buffered bike lanes, yielding rates are fine. So really all we can really point to here is um, an opportunity for moving the light pole to where it is in advance of the crosswalk. So if you're a driver, approaching the crosswalk, it's always better to have that light fixture shining in advance of the crosswalk and not really in the middle of it, as you see here. So this is, you know, a very minor adjustment and, or a minor recommendation, um, but we also recognize that you all probably had to put the poles where you had to put the poles based on things like driveway placement. So again, something just to, to consider. Um, the next one to the south is just south of Cook Road, um, very similar to the one I just looked at, um, you know, steady pedestrian activity. This is where the three lane cross section opens up, um, but otherwise yielding rates and visibility are, are pretty good, so we don't have any recommendations. Um, at Duck Deli, um, similar situation, good yielding rates. Um, there are some turning movement conflicts at the driveways, but nothing that we um, could point to as a substantial problem compared to a couple other places where we will um, offer some suggestions for in, improving some of that visibility. But otherwise, you know, uh, good visibility, good yielding. We don't have any recommendations here. Um, at Marlin Drive, there's not a marked crosswalk here. Um, this is essentially a, a, a opposite of the water tower. Um, you know, the vegetation can create some shadows. The tower can certainly as well. Um, we saw a little bit of pedestrian activity crossing near here, but nothing really substantial. Um, I think Andrew's data substantiated that there's not um, much in the way of pedestrian crossing activity. So we don't have any recommendations because as long as there are water tower there, there's not much of a destination across the road to, to want to cross to. Um, at Wee Winks, the shopping center, as well as some of the other retail establishments, um, this is essentially the first location where we saw enough turning movement activity that we, we could observe um, some, some uh, situations where drivers were um, maybe uh, surprised by a pedestrian in the crosswalks, there was some sudden braking, or maybe the, the driver who was in the turn lane to approach the, the shopping center and, and turn left into the shopping center would um, actually obscure the pedestrian trying to cross in the crosswalk. So um, this, this happens when we have these, you know, popular commercial districts in particular. So I will show you a, um, a diagram or a concept of something that we're recommending to help um, improve some of that visibility. Um, you know, again, it's a, a recommendation. We understand that you all have talked a lot about things like refuge islands in the past and that there are some other factors that you'll certainly have to, to weigh there. Um, so essentially our recommendation could be that, you know, given the narrowness of the driveways and some of these turning movement conflicts, um, that if the, uh, you know, if it works with the shop, with the uh, commercial property owner and others that, you know, the, the direction of, of entry and egress out of the shopping center could be one way. Um, if drivers were directed to go one way uh, into the shopping center at the northern entrance and exit in the southern entrance, now we have an opportunity to be able to install a refuge island at the crosswalk just south of Wee Wing. So by doing that, now we don't have um, a need for a driver to turn left into the shopping center um, just between the ABC store and the Wee Winks um, deli. So you know, that does provide that, uh, that opportunity for pedestrians to be more visible, to have that refuge space. 
And, and hopefully with the narrowness of the driveways, it may in fact help clarify um, some of the directions and, and possibly some of the um, problems in the parking lot itself. But we didn't spend a lot of time observing travel behaviors in the parking lot. So, you know, this again is really just focused on how can we improve some of the visibility at the crosswalk. Uh, the next one south is at Duck Bridge Village Court. Uh, there's not a crosswalk there. Um, the, the sidewalk is, is, is well set back from the road. Um, there's not really much in the way of a destination again across the roadway. So we don't have any recommendation for marking a crosswalk here, especially uh, because there is the, the substantial driveway nearby and, and not a lot of other, otherwise activity that we would expect. Um, south of Schooner Ridge, uh, the, the crosswalk is, we're, we're in the, the core part of the village where pedestrian activity is um, substantial and, and very heavy. So uh, because of that just regular flow of pedestrian crossing activity, we saw very acceptable pedestrian um, yielding to pedestrians. Um, the visibility is good. It's in a, a good part of the roadway. So no, no findings or recommendations to, to um, push here. Um, at the, the crosswalk um, at Town Hall, the one north, the northern more, uh, crosswalk, um, the, the crosswalk is in the curve, um, you know, and, and given what Brian was mentioning earlier about the, you know, more or less kind of regular spacing, um, anytime you have a curve like this, it's going to be hard to find a perfect space to be able to mark that crosswalk. But, um, you know, the crosswalk being in the curve, again, having heavy bike and ped traffic, those turning vehicles in that center turn lane are, again, just uh, similar to what the other situation I was just explaining. They, they can shield the pedestrian trying to cross, um, you know, especially if they're trying to enter the, the hardware store parking um, center. And, and again, you know, if, the, if somebody is um, suddenly stopping for a pedestrian, they, they might break very quickly, it can create some, uh, some quick responses, possibly even some rear end crashes. So uh, this is the recommendation where we will we'll, we'll suggest that you could consider removing the crosswalk uh, north of the bank driveway. I'll show you a, an illustration in just a minute. And then you know, consider installing a refuge island. So the white line is uh, essentially where the crosswalk is today. Um, you could uh, move the crosswalk just north of that exit out of the bank um, parking lot and install a refuge island. Basically the same concept as I was reviewing earlier, you know, we don't have a need for incoming left turns into the bank parking lot at that exit. Um, so that's an opportunity for the refuge island, especially in this curb. So, you know, we're, we're a little bit, uh, we've moved a little bit further out, the, 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 out of the curb, but, you know, again, there's still going to be some site distance concerns. Um, and, you know, it, but it is a place that could hopefully still serve um, where people are ultimately trying to go. Um, at Duck Landing Lane, um, the Mark Crosswalk, good yielding rates, moderate activity, you know, it's in a good spot from a visibility standpoint, didn't really see as much in the way of turning movement conflicts, so uh, no recommendations there. Um, the southernmost crosswalk to Town Hall, just north of Potesquite, um, similar as a lot of other locations, the visibility is good, um, moderate activity, and you know, with the, the infrastructure, we think that there's not really much else you could do there. So at Christopher Drive, um, you know, given the, the volume of um, the, well, the, the sheer amount of commercial activity there, uh, we were looking for, in particular, to see if there were you know, a lot of left turn movements in and out of that um, at Christopher Drive. Um, to see if there is enough to really kind of begin asking the question, should it be controlled? Should it be signalized? Um, a recommendation could be to explore that idea, but we're not recommending to signalize it based on any particular warrants or anything like that. Um, but it is a place where given the, the volumes of pedestrian activity, um, the, the conflicts and so forth, that it, it could be something that could be considered. But again, that's just really based on the pedestrian um, activity and not really based on any of those traffic um, findings that, that Andrew had shared. Um, so one other thing that could be um, considered here is that in lieu of a controlled crossing, you could um, stripe in um, essentially what is a painted median 
I'll show you an example at another location in just a minute of what I'm talking about. But, you know, just one other way of reinforcing that you want to try to, you know, maintain that space for pedestrians and not for vehicles to uh, queue up for turns within a certain space. So anyway, it's a fairly low cost um, op option there. Um, at the Farmer's Daughter Scarborough Shops Crosswalk, um, we noticed a handful of things that um, need to be just basically considered kind of moving forward. Um, with the, uh, the left turning vehicle traffic, you know, similar to the other sites I mentioned, um, they can view the uh, block the view of the pedestrians when other drivers are approaching from behind. This is the one of the heaviest pedestrian crossing activity sites. I think it may have been the heaviest crossing location based on the data that Andrew was sharing. Um, and you know, because of all of that, it, it's certainly a place to just continue monitoring and, and consider some recommendations for it. Um, again, could be a place where you could stripe in a painted median, not a raised one per se, but something that just really reinforce um, a space where you, you want to um, keep drivers you know, out of the crossing space in particular. Could move the light poles. Um, uh, they're not exactly where we would prefer that they be, that you know, better to have them in advance of the crosswalk. But again, you know, just looking at the site-by-site -site locations. This is, of course, very closely related to the Scarborough Lane intersection, given how close it is. So, you know, you just really have to think about this and the Scarborough Lane location kind of in tandem. So if, for example, um, you know, you wanted to, to stripe in the median or even put in a raised median here, um, want to think about if there, if you move in this direction, uh, you know, just making sure that we're, we're coordinating with what's happening down at Scarborough Lane itself. Okay, so at Scarborough Lane, there's not a crosswalk currently, um, and there's not a, a ramp that is directing the uh, pedestrians to cross at Scarborough Lane. Um, one thing uh, that we noticed while we were there is that at the time the developer of the shops was installing a new staircase to um, come to the intersection. Um, the, the sidewalk, I believe, since then that, he, that they've constructed um, takes folks just basically like what you see here. It doesn't create a curb ramp that then crosses um, NC-12, but it would be a place that we would recommend that you continue to monitor because if, if there is increased pedestrian activity to access the shops to that stair, staircase, we might begin to notice more pedestrian activity crossing at the intersection where there's not a marked crosswalk. So if you, if you observe that and there seems to be an, a need for installing a new crosswalk here, you'd probably wanna review whether you need to maintain the crosswalk at the farmer's daughter location, just given how close they are to one another. Um, and then just to the south of that at the Aqua restaurant, um, this is very similar to what we have at the Northern end of the village. Well, uh, where you start to see some of the transitions between the shared use path and the um, in-road bike lanes. Um, the signage again could be clarified to help uh, the bicyclist approaching to understand in advance about some of those transitions. Um, we understood that there may be some considerations about, um, I think it's, uh, I can't remember the full name of the cottage, but there's a property, I think that's for sale. Um, you know, if, if those are all things that are in, in movement or there's some consideration there, um, you know, that, that may provide some opportunities for improving any crosswalks um, at this location. This, like some of the other places, you know, you could consider installing a median or a refuge island um, for those bicycle transitions like you have on the northern end with some of the appropriate signage to indicate that. So here's just an illustration of, of conceptually how that could play out, essentially just putting in the refuge island and then you know, indicating with that advanced signage at the aqua location. Okay, and then the other, the, the island that's already installed um, at the, the southern uh, entrance to the village, um, you know, it's not a marked crosswalk, it's not intended as a crossing. We didn't notice any pedestrian safety problems there. Um, this is also a transition between the three and two lane uh, cross section. It, this feedback sign that the, uh, the raised island essentially serves in a traffic calming perspective or capacity, and it seems to work. So um, in fact, we've, we've taken pictures of this and are thinking of this as an example that we can share with other parts of the state. 
All right, last section. Um, so this is south of the village. And while there are a, um, there is a marked crosswalk, what we were doing here is trying to be consistent with some of the, um, you know, decisions or the other marked crosswalks, especially in the northern end of the village. Um, so we looked at, you know, any situation where they're like Seahawk or Tuckahoe or Bias or Charles Jenkins, where the roadway um, connects on both sides. So not, we didn't look um, in depth at any of the T intersections or um, a roadway like um, Seabreeze where it, it does not connect across the roadway, but rather where are there these kind of natural connections across the roadway. Um, so I'll go through each of these again. And um, you know, we've got a couple of recommendations here as well. So starting, um, you know, again, with this being that 35 mile per hour posted speed, you know, this, the speeds are picking up, they're transitioning, the multi-use path on the east side um, works well for where people seem to want to go, especially if they're trying to access the, the um, any destinations along the east side of the roadway. Um, however, you know, there's not much in the way of connectivity on the west side or the sound side of the, of the roadway. And in a couple places, especially near Charles Jenkins, you know, that could help improve um, options for people to be able to go up to a marked crosswalk and, and then cross there. Um, you know, it's not the, the most developed part of Duck, but we, we certainly observed um, uh, opportunities for people to cross. And I think Andrew's um, data uh, showed good, good crossing activity, especially at, at the marked crosswalk in other locations. Um, so at Tuckahoe, there is a marked crosswalk. Um, it's, it, does, it has the advance or it has the warning sign um, but there's no other controls um, and there's no overhead lighting. So this is really similar to some of the situations um, near the Sanderling uh, where we would recommend installing overhead lighting. Uh, the sign uh, is fairly recent, so it seems still to have that reflective quality. But uh, again, you know, this is just something to, to help improve basic um, visibility. Um, Charles Jenkins doesn't have a marked crosswalk and it's, um, at least from our vantage point, has a lot of similarities to, to Tuckahoe. So, um, you know, thinking back and forth between it and a lot of other similar locations, uh, it, it seems like it would be a good place to consider marking a new crosswalk, um, installing the lighting, the warning sign, and in order to facilitate for someone, say, uh, leaving a home near Jaycrest, to be able to have some kind of walkway parallel to the, to the road, um, on the west side or the sound side to get them up to the crosswalk um, in, in some of those, those sections would, would make a lot of sense. So having short sections of walkway to get folks up to the crosswalk um, where new crossings, because this is a fairly long stretch uh, with Tuckahoe having the only marked crosswalk. So that's all of the crosswalks across NC-12. Um, just a few basic observations of some of the side path crossings and just the side path in general, and then definitely want to um, get any questions you all have. Um, we didn't formally evaluate the side path or, you know, the side path crossings in, um, to a large extent. Um, just a few basic observations. You know, there's a signage at some of them, especially the longer crossings of the side paths or the side streets. Um, that indicate that bicyclists are expected to stop at those intersections. Um, we did not observe too many cyclists or any cyclists stopping at those intersections, but it did appear that most cyclists were taking some level of care when they were um, crossing the roadway. So, you know, it's just something to think about, about uh, whether the sign is communicating what you are expecting of cyclists to do, or maybe you want to put in um, some other kind of um, signage or maybe even a message on the, on the pavement. Um, as I'm sure you all know, in some sections, the side path, especially the older section south of the village, can be pretty narrow. So if you're passing another cyclist or another pedestrian, um, it can be pretty, pretty tight. And that's when we would see or notice some cyclist exiting the pathway fairly suddenly, entering the roadway and then coming back in. Or maybe it was when there was some, um, you know, um, routes or some other things were making the pathway less than level. So anyways, those are some, some of the observations along the way. And then again, at those transitions, especially north of the village, um, where the, the bike lane would um, transition fairly suddenly, 
We did notice in a couple cases where cyclists were traveling the wrong way. Um, they were basically cycling against traffic in the roadway. Um, can only speculate that that's because they they weren't expecting to have to transition and they they were just uh, taking the bike lane until they found a safe location, probably to get back up on the sidewalk, I would expect. But, you know, again, putting in some of that advanced signage to indicate how those transitions could work um, could hopefully help mitigate that. So, um, but again, it was fairly rare and, you know, there weren't um, specific uh, events or crashes that were giving us that indication. So that's all of the crosswalks that we evaluated. Um, you know, in summary, the yielding rates um, are exceptional. Uh, the visibility could be improved in a couple of locations, especially where you have those turning movement conflicts. And, um, you know, we don't have um, uh, this. This was really based on some of those observations made in the field, you know, again, kind of validating it with some of the data that Andrew's team collected. But, um, you know, you all have a great infrastructure network, and it seems to be working for helping get people um, the options of being able to, to walk and bike through town. So good job. <laughs> Any questions? I have a question, maybe it's for Brian, but uh, there's a lot of recommendations there, a lot of very good recommendations. Uh, are those types of recommendations, activities that are done by DOT, the town, or in joint with the DOT and the town? mostly from an expense standpoint. Sure, um, yeah, that's a good good question. I, I think at this point, these are just recommendations for consideration. So if they were to move forward, um, there would need to be some conversations uh, with division one as well um, and, um, and kind of go through, work through some processes of um, funding options that the department has or cost sharing between the town uh, and DOT, or in some cases, um, some that would need to be fully done by the town, such as probably the lighting or some of the, um, um, if um, some of the one-way aspects through the, uh, you know, like the Wee Wings grocery store and, you know, things like that. But, um, but yeah, there are, we do have programs uh, available to, to consider this. Some of the recommendations are minor. Um, and you know the signing in particular is is one that um, uh, we can work with Division One on on those. Uh, it's possible that the some of the uh, pavement marking changes might can be done soon, uh, or could be done the next time the road is is resurfaced. Um, so there's just a lot of those kind of considerations that have to be um, made on funding, but. Um, I, I think the first step is really to for your, for you guys to have a chance to absorb some of the recommendations and to to uh, to, to think those through. Thank you, Brian. Discussion questions. I just had a question. Um, if uh, the on uh, for Lauren on the observations and recommendations was the focus primarily on pedestrian safety. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so that's really the, the the lens that you were looking at it for, just because, frankly, we've had some pushback on the number of crosswalks we have already, and um, mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of like the idea of realigning a few, particularly, um, you know, but uh, the idea of adding a few could really uh, be a, a tough um, conversation to have with neighboring neighbor with the with the world in general but anyway i was just curious to make sure that you uh that you that that was your i think you had mentioned that i was just making sure i understood that thank you yes lauren i have another question for you on the wee Wings crossover was any mm -hmm. consideration given to reversing that flow around the uh, buildings seems to me you'd want to enter by the market and come out the other end but you had it the other way around well let me just say again we didn't collect Tra uh, traffic counts at the uh, shopping center. So, you know, I think these are very conceptual recommendations. I, I would I would encourage you to collect additional data to help describe which would be the better traffic flow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I, I think too, just to add to that, um, we, with the concept that was shared today, it was from the perspective of leaving the crosswalk where it currently is, possibly enhancing it with the refuge, and then adjusting the circulation based on that. And, and the reason we 
we took that approach was we know that the crosswalk used to be slightly north of where it is now at um, at the intersection. I'm drawing a blank on the name of, of the side street. Mm -hmm. Yes, right, Wampum. Right there. Mm -hmm. yep. And so that, um, you know, and I, I, we we really we got some feedback from from the town that you know it had been the, the crosswalk had been moved from that location because of concerns about conflicts with with turning vehicles, and, and so that was, but it, it could go either way. You could adjust the flow uh, to one way uh, through uh, through through the wee winks, you know, in either direction. Um, but that decision would also involve um, you know the relocation of the crosswalk. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Brian. These additional common islands, were they just painted ones or were they raised islands? Um, for the most part, they would be raised islands or that's what we've been recommending. But there's been a couple spots in here where uh, that wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily have to go to that extent. It could be a painted island. But any of these locations where we're really focusing on some of those turning movement conflicts, you need that raised island to reinforce it. And I'll just I'll, I'll make a comment if I may, Mayor, from the from the fire chief. Uh, that third lane, that center lane, is really what helps our fire apparatus get through the village north south. Um, same with EMS coming from the south and police. So the, the raised islands obviously then force the trucks back into the, the travel lane. So that that's just another another kind of wrinkle in it because that's. Your raised islands are great um, unless you're driving a, a fire truck or an ambulance. And we did, if, if I, I know there are folks who will recall when we did the pedestrian plan in 2000, I think it was maybe 2014, we did consider some additional raised islands and that was the feedback and that's why they were limited to the one at uh, Sunset Grill and then the one that is the non-crosswalk south of the village uh, there we, we we had recommended one at christopher for instance and the concern about emergency vehicles was why that wasn't an eventual part of the plan so again the, what, what you're hearing today is some observations focused on pedestrian safety for consideration and as lauren's saying if, if you're considering that you know for those reasons a raised island is probably a good idea if there are other factors like emergency access, you might consider painting them instead of raising them. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Anything else further from uh, council? Thank you very much, Lauren. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Andrew. Thank you. All very good information. We appreciate it. We're going to go on to item number three, closed session. And I uh, have a Somewhere, I do. And the closed session will be only for counsel and attorney. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion that we enter into closed session in accordance with section 143-318.11A1 of the North Carolina General Statutes to prevent the disclosure of information that is privileged or confidential pursuant to the law of this state or of the United States or not considered a public record within the meaning of chapter 132 of the general statutes. Any discussion on the motion on the floor? There being none, all in favor to go in closed session, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Are we now in closed session? We were out of uh, closed session. I'd like to ask uh, Attorney Robert Hobbs if he would report uh, the closed session. Thank you, Mayor. During the closed session, the council members reviewed and approved our closed session meeting minutes for the following dates, June 17th, 2020, July 16th, 2020, July 20th, 2020, July 24th, 2020, August 5th, 2020, August 26th, 2020, September 2nd, 2020, September 16th, 2020, October 7th, 2020, November 4th, 2020, the 4 p.m. meeting, uh, November 4th, 2020, the 7 p.m. meeting, 
November 18th, 2020, and there were three closed sessions uh, on that day. December 4th, 2020, December 10th, 2020, and there were three closed sessions on that day. December 11th, 2020, there were two closed sessions on that day. January 6, 2021, February 3rd, 2021, March 3rd, 2021, April 7th, 2021, May 5th, 2021, June 16th, 2021, and August 4th, 2021. And all of those minutes will be sealed and will remain as such until any further action by the council. Thank you, Robert. Is there any other business coming before council this evening? There being none, I'll remind council our next scheduled meeting will be the regular meeting on Wednesday, December 1st, 2021 at 6 p.m. With that, I'll entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. All in favor, please say aye. 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 The meeting is adjourned.